Hello, my name is Gary Cox, and uh, I'm with Artful Dodger. Uh, we're pretty much all here tonight, and we've just, we're just about to do a show in Cleveland at the Agora. This is the 25th anniversary, and we're glad to be here. And um, we really wish Gary Harwood could have been here, but now he apparently had a date, so he couldn't do this or something. Next, uh, we have some questions. Yes, uh, last time we heard from you, um, I believe in 1980, was the release of the Rayvon album, Absolutely. followed by the tour that year. And then in May of 81, Steve Magazine ran a front page article on you people saying that there was a break in the action for Artful Dodger. Mm -hmm. Then there was your show in uh, August of 81, and since then we haven't heard Great memory. Wow. <laughs> August 21st. Wow, this is scary, you know. This, um, this is your look. If you could let us know what you've been doing. Uh, we'd like to defer this question to Steve Cooper, who will answer this. He's our uh, mouthpiece. Uh, what have we been doing musically? Um, musically, yeah. always. Actually, probably most of us here have been involved in uh, different projects that everybody else has helped on. Mm -hmm. Gary Cox wrote a batch of real good country music songs, and I think everybody played on it. And Gary Harewood sent some demo tapes, and everybody played on it. And uh, Peter's been playing with everybody, and Steve and I have been playing together. And of course, I haven't been playing at all. Bill's got right. <laughs> well, they actually see Gary Cox invited me to come and sing these country songs, and I came and sang them, and he said, "Don't call me, I'll call you." <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a thing like that. So I said, oh, "Okay, well, I'll write my own." Who learned to play the guitar? Yeah, yeah. And I actually yeah. learned how to play beyond just um, you know playing for my kids or you know duly annoyed at the, at the fact that I've played for them over the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> so, right? Yeah, Gary's country songs. Um, going back to 80, you know, 79, you, um, your band recorded some live shows that were supposed yeah. to be released. Yeah, we can't find those tapes. Do you guys know where those are? Because no, somebody, I was wondering if there was any... Did somebody say bootleg? No, no Clive Davis has those. Yeah, Clive Davis probably has those along with the busboy live tapes. Mm -hmm. But we had a finished yeah. side. We had a side totally finished, ready to go, a lot of material it was great. Mm -hmm. It's got a version of Twisted yeah. Shout on there, uh, Honor Among Thieves, Wayside, Side, Up Green, Come Close. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great good stuff. stuff, too. It's really good. I mean, we were really happy with that. And, and actually, we did, given our brothers, we would have had a side of live material that everybody was familiar with and some new stuff, and perhaps some of the stuff that, was, that actually came out on Ray Bond would have been on a fifth record, but... Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes things like that don't work out, so we just have to go with the program like it might be. There were a number of songs also that uh, didn't appear on Rayvon. Uh, they would uh, sometimes and maybe on all right. Yeah, sometimes. What a they wonder. Didn't. That was really a neat thing. You fact, remember, but it didn't come out on yeah, Rayvon. Well, Steve Cooper owns the only recorded tape of sometimes that I know of to be in existence. And um, it's like real scary. It's like, it was, like we were possessed by a uh, sort of demi-metal man. <laughs> you know, I don't know what that was, but it was, uh, it was really a neat song. We really had a good time with that. Um, it just scared us too much to you know, think about doing that. Really. Mm -hmm. um, CBS was re-released on the Yes. Uh, we re-released the first album and the, and the third album. And uh, based on some things that I'm involved in right now with David Cripps, who was originally involved in the band as a manager, uh, it looks as though Arista is going to take the Areola record and do something with it. And there is a CBS production deal that I'm involved in at this at this point, which will um, it will there'll be some sort of a record. So well, I see you money for this. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> some sort of fact, this is because I'm using your face and you know in, in my photos. Yeah. Um, directing this question to Gary, um, on the album, these albums, the song Dandelion. Yeah. Which is dedicated to Brian Jones. Right. You're wondering why was it dedicated to Brian Jones? Good question. It's not that Brian Jones. He was a painter. He got his painted his house and he yeah. finished it. Well, that's right. Yeah. Well, you know, there are a couple, a couple of reasons. One was I always associated with Brian Jones. He was always a little bit separated from the rest of the Stones and you know everything he went through. And I think that we were all Stones fans. Sure. And I used to associate a lot with him. I wanted to write a song called Dandelion because the Stones did it. And I thought, darn, I did it. I wrote it. I'm going to dedicate it to the guy. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. really a wonderful song. It's and then there's partly, uh, there's another story, you know, along with that. I, 
I was going through a hard time with a girl at the time, you know, and uh, I didn't want to give her the privilege of knowing that I had dedicated a song to her. <laughs> so I threw off Travis dedicated it to Brian Jones. I actually, I actually can't. And she changed her name to Brian Jones. <laughs> yeah, it's not me, but it, you know, he wouldn't do that, so, so. Yeah. yeah, but it's just a thing. Yeah. After um, the release of Babes on Broadway, that tour featured a lot of songs from that album. And then subsequent tours, the songs from that album were conspicuously absent. Mm -hmm. Was there any reason? Or not so conspicuously. Um, well, pro I, I think by about that time, I think Gary wasn't playing with us because that was really in between the third and fourth album by the time we were out there doing that. Um, for anybody who looks at that album and looks in terms of who wrote what on it, Gary wrote about half of the record, yeah. I think. And so Gary and I, you know, being that we were doing the uh, material we wrote, it really precluded us doing much except the songs we had, we had written. Um, the other side of that coin was there was a lot that I had done on Gary's stuff in terms of background singing and other stuff and stuff he had done on the songs we wrote. And because of the contribution we each made to each other's material on the record, it made it virtually impossible for us to go out and um, duplicate that line. Yeah. So we probably tended to stay away from that a little bit. Um, um, and now, of course, you know we are doing a couple of things from that. That record, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to do that. Which, uh, Unless Gary gets silly again, and then we, you know, we're asking to go to Nashville or something. Like that. <laughs> Four guys with yeah. cocks. <laughs> Which album does the band feel is its finest? Well, my very first favorite album last. is well, first and last. Everybody always says I. I really like the Raycon album. I really like that album. I, I think that in terms of artful Dodger, I think that that probably. Uh, probably is really just sums up. It probably sums up all three of the of the, all of the three previous records very nicely on that on that one album. You know, with new stuff. Ray Mon was an Artful Dodger album. That was an Artful Dodger produced right. album. We produced that record with Bob Jones. Peter was involved. Too. And Peter was involved. Yeah. Uh, uh, great producer. Would you um, consider the description hard power pop? To um, I would consider it, I would throw it out. No, I heavy, <laughs> heavy if not hard. Right. <laughs> no, I think, um, I think it's, you know, we, we certainly, we've, we've been given that, just that uh, description. Uh, uh, probably, uh, from, a, from a musical standpoint, you, you tend to see, or from a songwriting standpoint, rather, you tend to see how the song originated, and many of the songs came from an acoustic guitar standpoint, you know, I mean, uh, Gary or I, or, or Gary Cox, not so much on the phone with one dog because he wasn't there. Or Saddam Hussein. Uh, you know, you like write this stuff with an acoustic guitar and you sort of say, well, okay, this is a good song because it sounds good when I play it to the band, but. Um, there he is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, my grandfather, he's the spirit, he's been here a while, you know, he's like wanting this theater. Um, so, you know, power pop is something people hear after the fact. Mm -hmm. Acoustic pop is something we hear when we're, when we're writing this music. Mm -hmm. Would you call it? Hard power pop, which is what most people yeah. into some of the pop songs. It's probably just bad guitar tones. Happy <laughs> good. That's <laughs> not probably sure Steve Bowen going to do this might be a difficult question to answer from the standpoint that by being Artful Dodger, you've never experienced seeing Artful Dodger live. Right. But to what do you attribute the intense watchability of the band? Um, the fact that I'm very attractive. No. <laughs> Watch every episode of Bronco Lane. <laughs> no, I would say that um, Everybody, when you when you are a performer and you go out on stage, you have um, an idea about what you want to project. And, um, isn't this scary? This is horrible. Now let me just let me throw this question to Steve Cooper. <laughs> what was the question? How would you describe? No, I don't even want to tell you what the question is. No, you, you just you sort of have this idea about what you want to project. And um, if you're successful doing that, then wonderful. Otherwise, you know, you hope somebody has a video camera so you can laugh or cry. And Let's tell the truth. We practice in front of big, that's it. stealing it's mirrors. That's <laughs> <laughs> We practice all the time in front of... Shit, I'm a ball! <laughs> <laughs> um, how long have you been 
Merkel Badger. Uh, could you tell us how you and Gary Hurwitz first met? How we first met? In jail. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing. Uh, Selling crack. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Hugh Downs or Steve Bridget or whichever person is on the end. Phil Ray Van called home instead. And uh, Steve Cooper and I were in a much better band called Bad. And, uh, God, they said, please, can we join your band? You guys are much better. It was a uh, on the practice for a while. It was actually a thing where, you know, you kind of had the song idea or something you're afraid to show it to anybody but you sort of have enough blood watchers one night where you say hey man can I show you this song and they say sure man show me so you know I like showing this thing and we sort of just sort of started out doing that you know with that because at, the, at a time when when Steve wasn't with Artful Dodger uh, I was and you know we started writing songs and doing that thing well, I don't really know I mean we just kind of fell into it it wasn't it's really much Two bands have been in a nightclub and they like it and they got right. together and they said, yeah. 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 I, uh, we found them following the same chicks and it was, it was really <laughs> <laughs> I remember back in uh, 1980 at uh, August 21st, Spanky Show, you mentioned that it was Whoa. Dodger's seventh birthday. It was it was what? Arthur Dodger's seventh birthday. I must have lied. No, I didn't. So, I didn't. Uh, what significance does August 21st? It's probably, I, oh, I know, August 21st, we used to practice down my parents' basement, and uh, what happened on August 21st was Gary Irwin had just changed strings, and you know, the, the, like, the like first string or high E string is very sharp, it's a very narrow string, and he took it off what remained from the string and threw it on the floor, and my father was walking down the stairs in his stocking feet, and he steps on the string like this, and he didn't say, gosh, would you guys get out of my house, damn it. He just pulled the string out from the bottom of his foot. We said, you really need to find the trash can. <laughs> we said, right, yeah. So that was kind of the birth of the thing in terms of like a really long um, line. It's something we could hang our hat on. So that, that's really how that happened. What did Steve? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Dox was upstairs drinking tea, talking to my mother and Steve's mom. Yeah, he yeah. was. Yeah. Um, that was first album resulted from a trip that Gary's to New yeah. York. You want to tell us about that? Oh, yeah, I knew you were going. Um, yeah. I got into, I got into uh, Gary Harrow's album collection. And on the back of all the albums, I wrote down all the managers in New York of all the bands that I felt associated with our sound. I had a nice little list going. And uh, one morning, I jumped on Amtrak. Excuse me. Went to New York. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me, you jumped on Amtrak? Who paid for that? <laughs> <laughs> you did. <laughs> okay. And let's see, I got the pencil. So I'm paying back to that. Doc still wants his money for this ticket. No, it was, it was quite a, a dream come true for us. I think they shot in a garage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. really walked into um, this office, and this manager was managing the New York Dolls and, and a band that was having relative success in Boston called Aerosmith. And uh, he, he heard Bill's song, uh, he put it on, he said, uh, don't take it anywhere else. We want to sign this band. And I went home that night with the contract, basically. It's over. This song is over. Yeah, I got in the contract. Well, there's like a really and funny thing. did not sell out because Oprah wanted to buy that. It's over. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> yeah, we're like still negotiating with him right now. And it was kind of a funny thing, though, because Gary called us from David Craig's office, who was the leader of Craig's at that time. He called us and he said, look, I'm talking to this guy, and, uh, you know, this guy that manages the, the Donalds and some band called Aerosmith, and he says, don't go anywhere else. And we're going, Carl Marx, this is go somewhere else. Yeah. Go somewhere else. Nobody believes You know, I mean, we're like, what are you talking about, man? Because, and David Krebs told me later on that the reason that he entertained Gary in the office that day and listened to this tape was because Gary didn't come in wearing knee-high snakeskin boots and yeah. leotards and, you know, and whatever the hell else you might have worn in 1973 or 4, you know, if you were in a rock and roll band. He said, I saw this guy who was a very attractive guy who was sort of normal looking who kind of came in and said, Hi, I'm with this band and we have this tape. 
Yeah. You know, he says, I really got to hear this take, you know, from this guy like this. You know, sort of, because, I mean, he's, obviously, these guys sing it all. I mean, we couldn't have, we couldn't have overdressed for the occasion, you know. He was dressed like a mailman. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said, I didn't think of it every time. I the perfect shot. <laughs> Having originally been known as Brat, what prompted the change to our production? There was a band in New York that had met with um, some really um, disgusting reviews named Brat, and we weren't aware of them at the time that we went up there. And so uh, we decided that we kind of liked the idea of that, but um, we had to do away with Brat. And uh, I don't know, I don't even remember how the how Artful Dodger thing came on, except that we were probably looking through the comics, you know. Connie thought of it, and um, is it the Artful Dodger? <coughs> yeah, that's kind of an interesting character, sort of Brad, I guess, in an odd sort of way in this book. So, so we went with that. Oliver Twist. Yeah. Um, seeing as how you and Gary write most of Dodger's material, could you give us some insight into how you develop your compositions? Um, mostly Budweiser, I think. No, um, no there's. Typically, there, there, there isn't there, there isn't really, honestly, any sort of a set thing. I mean, you have sometimes you have a musical idea, and sometimes you have a you know, lyrical thing. And uh, we try to extract, first of all, what the intent of the other person is out of the lyric or musical thing, and then you try to put it together as um, a whole thing. It's um, it's, it's really a lot easier if you write for yourself, albeit a lot narrower in terms of the final thing. Uh, but Gary and I work very handily with each other. So we sort of have this intuitive understanding about what we want to happen. And uh, it's worked out very well for us. And there, there just, in, in any kind of summer, there is no set thing. Just, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Question directed to Gary Cox. Those are some really uh, powerful materials for Dodger. Yeah. Um, how do I write? Mm -hmm. Come on. Oh, it usually starts with uh, a guitar piece that sounds good, and I, I know I have to put lyrics to it, so I struggle for lyrics. I do a lot of driving around in a car, singing myself. That's where all the songs came from. Just those cut words at a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> I've mean, yeah. got some letters from him. I, I was never prolific. <laughs> Open up your door. Every song was like a major problem, obstacle. Just, you know, putting every chord together. I just drove myself nuts with every song I wrote. And I wish I was more prolific. I, I've written maybe seven or eight songs in ten years. <laughs> Just take so long to run each one. Open up your door. Yeah, it's freezing outside. Damn it. That's the live version. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyone familiar with your music knows that an integral part of the uh, sound of Dodge comes from uh, Steve's, yeah. Steve's drumming. His, um, oh, jumpy shit. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, how does that play into it? It doesn't. It doesn't. It's good. It's good. It's gifts. How many drummers it takes to change a light bulb? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The machine does that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Steve, of course, has it. Um, how, how, do, how do I put this? He has a way of taking uh, every every song we've ever brought to the band, and I'm talking about Gary and I, I can't speak for Gary Cox, obviously. Um, Steve has a way of bringing the song to life by way of the drums. And of course, Steve Cooper, too. I mean, all that rhythm section that's worked together for a long time. And um, it just, it makes our job so easy because the bottom's sort of laid out, and so on. Steve and Steve continue to do that, we'll continue to bring them songs. As soon as they stop doing that, we'll stop bringing them music, you know what I'm saying? That's simple. <laughs> we pretty much run drum and we get this. Yeah. 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 As soon as we get paid. Huh? <laughs> I uh, understand that a number of years ago, Ronnie Van Zandt gave me a microphone stand. Yeah, he did. He gave me, uh, gave me a microphone stand. He understood I was a big Rod Stewart fan, you know, when I was a kid. And, uh, Get his 
microphone stand and um, somebody has to spill one, you know, from my hotel room. It's probably with my mirror in the party or something. But, uh, I no longer have it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, on the inside jacket of the second and third album, there's a sketch from the band by Gary Cox. Mm -hmm. I wonder what is the way to that. Send in my bedroom one night. Just, you know, I was trying this. You know, just for the fun of it. And I realized, oh my god, that was like Gary Harrow. <laughs> so I kept on you know, doing these faces. So funny. You know, the haircuts. Mm -hmm. and, um, I took it to the band and showed everybody you know, just yeah, see what they thought. It. And I oh, thought, well, the hard part is to start now because I wanted to put the faces in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really doesn't need faces. I don't know, I don't know who's just stopping at that point. So, it's great like that, just leave it like that. So we took it to CBS and wound up on t-shirts and album covers. Unfortunately, the next album will be white. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Aren't there um, like memories that stand out from the recording of the four albums for the studio time? Yeah, sure. Memories. Yeah, any particular How much time memories? Got here? <laughs> wow, I mean, that's a two hour long yeah. yeah. rhinoceros. <laughs> I'll tell you, there's a really interesting thing that happened. Well, we did the second album, I don't know why I think of this, but we were doing it with it. Um, studio B, we made a record player, and we did most of that with it. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we were mixing. I, I'm pretty sure it was mixing. And uh, this guy came in, you know, this guy that was down in Studio A working with some other band. I don't remember who it was. And uh, he walked by, and Gary, it was during Gary's um, uh, sort of opening guitar part to on our own phase. And this guy stops, and I'm sitting out there. I think Gary Cox and I were sitting out there. He says, "Is that them?" I said. Is that who? He said, is that the Rolling Stone? I said, yeah, it is. He said, son of a bitch. He said, that's great. So Cox and I are like laughing right. I saw this guy was out there and then he went across the Rolling yeah. Stone. Sorry. So <laughs> the studio thing, you know, that was, that was kind of a funny thing that happened with that. I don't know why. Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. I think it was. I don't know. He was impressed. Yeah. I didn't want to say that. Yeah. Any future plans that you'd like to share? Oh, uh, sleeping tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as far in the future as I can see, right? We're pretty well set, you know, in our ways. But, and, you know, the things we've been doing for the past 10 years, I mean, everybody's got to do it. We're pretty scattered out. And to get the band back together with all these projects going on, you know, it's. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. So right now, I know this was done for one reason, and that was to say thanks to Hank Lacani for breaking us in this town. Mostly the fact that it's yeah. so wonderful to play with you guys. Yeah, it is. It's great to play together. I'm glad to have us on video. Yeah. It's, it's, really, it's, been, an, it's been an amazing rehearsal thing that we've, that we've gone through. And, um, nothing that could come out of this, that could potentially come out of this, could possibly surprise me. This has just been such an absolutely wonderful time doing this. I mean, this is like, these are my brothers, these are my closest friends. I mean, I, I can't imagine playing with anybody else when I play with these guys. You know, I just think mean, that's the truth. <laughs> Okay. <laughs>